We are a people who were created to live, but because of sin, we are destined to die. And so God's plan for his Messiah was for him to come into the world and pay the price of that rebellion, to bear the judgment for sin at the cross, and then to rise again in victory over the grave. Welcome to Encounter the Truth with Jonathan Griffiths. We're continuing a message called The Risen King. And Jonathan, I've got uh, a, a friend of mine who likes to say, sometimes as believers, we don't always share the full gospel if we leave out the resurrection. I mean, if we talk about the fact that Jesus died on the cross for our sins, yes, that is true, but you know, could potentially be a little incomplete there if we don't talk about the fact that he rose again, conquering sin and conquering death. Why is the resurrection so important? Oh, the resurrection is so vitally important, and it's such a wonderful thing to consider. I mean, on a most basic level, you know, the claims of Jesus, of his earthly ministry and of his life, they only hold water, really, if Jesus did it indeed rise from the grave. I mean, if Jesus taught all that he taught and, and said, look, I'm, I'm going to the cross, I'm going to die, and after three days I'm going to rise again, if he didn't rise, well, all his teaching can be written off as irrelevant, as, as the teaching of a madman. But if he, if he did indeed rise from the grave, it means that he is who he claimed to be, and we need to take seriously his teaching. So that's, that, that's one aspect of things. But of course, the resurrection, the victory of Jesus over the grave, holds the promise that we too will rise if we trust in him. It shows us that he has the power over death and the grave, and he can carry us through death and into life, even as he made that journey himself. And so the resurrection is absolutely central to the Christian hope. Well, what a great thing for us to be thinking about as we begin our time together. If you can, grab a Bible, join us in John chapter 20, as we continue our message, The Risen King. Here is Jonathan. In the next scene, we come to see the disciples gathered in a house, cowering with the doors locked. The religious leaders that lobbied to put Jesus to death only days ago, they think perhaps they will come for them next. But in the midst of this fearful scene, Jesus appears. He speaks peace to them. And he shows them his hands and his side, still bearing the wounds of the cross even now in resurrection life. One of the disciples was missing from this gathering, a disciple named Thomas, and he ends up having his own unique experience of the risen Jesus. And this is where we pick up the story now. I'd like to read from verse 24 of chapter 20. And it would be great if you could follow with me if you've got a Bible where you are. John chapter 20, verse 24, down to the end of the chapter. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands, and put your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. Thomas wasn't there when Jesus appeared to the others in that locked room. So he heard about the resurrection of Jesus secondhand. The other disciples tell him, we've seen the Lord. He hears the message, but he doesn't physically encounter the risen Jesus. And for Thomas, that's just not good enough. For Thomas, it's all simply too hard to contemplate, too difficult to accept and believe. And so he speaks those words for which he has become famous, for which he has become known as the doubting Thomas. He says, unless I see 
in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into his side, I will never believe. Now, it's easy for us to be hard on Thomas, I think, but, but the truth is, the other disciples, they were able to see before they believed. And truthfully, we can understand on some level how Thomas feels. After all, the miracle of a dead man rising again to life, it is a big miracle. It is a huge deal. Well, eight days go by. And the disciples are back in the room with the doors locked, still fearful, no doubt. And this time Thomas is there. He's with them. Jesus appears to them again. And again he says to them, peace be with you. Jesus could have come along and, and rebuked Thomas and given him a hard time for his failure, his refusal to believe based on the testimony of the other disciples. But Jesus is so kind and Jesus is so patient, and he says to him, come on, observe the evidence for yourself, the evidence that you have demanded, touch my hands, touch my side, and believe. Now, it seems as though Thomas stopped short of doing that, but simply seeing the evidence for himself, he answers with a powerful confession of faith, my Lord and my God. Thomas has seen the evidence, and Thomas has now believed. It's, it's not wrong to see the evidence of the risen Jesus, of course. That was the special privilege of the first generation of believers. But Jesus wants to use this opportunity to teach us something very important, to record a vital lesson, not so much for Thomas then, but for us now, for us today. He wants us to know that seeing him physically, having the evidence before our eyes, it is not necessary for us to have that if we are to believe. In fact, says Jesus, there is true blessing available for those who do not see and who yet believe. Verse 29, Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. It's fine to be part of that first generation, to see the risen Jesus. We, we might imagine that they are the specially blessed generation and that we are at some huge disadvantage today. But, but Jesus says no. The, the generations to come who believe without seeing, they are truly blessed. There is a special blessing from God for those who will hear the word of the apostles, just as Thomas actually heard it back in verse 25, and who will accept that apostolic message on faith. The blessing upon such people is nothing less than this. It is acceptance by God, and it is the gift of eternal salvation. It is the blessing of life. And it is just as equally available to those who do not see as it is to those who did. Now, at this point, John the Apostle, he moves out of the background. He, he steps away from simply being the narrator of the story, and he steps into the foreground, and he tells us why he has written his book. He tells us how he, as one apostle and one eyewitness of these events, how he intends to be part of the process of belief. Verse 30. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, in, in my gospel, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. Jesus did so much else in his earthly ministry. He, he performed so many miracles that were signs of his identity and signs of his mission. But, John says, I have written this much down in my book so that you may believe and that by believing you may have life. As we celebrate Easter Sunday 2,000 years after the events of the historical resurrection of Jesus. You and I, we don't have access to the visible, physical evidence of the resurrection. The risen Jesus, he is now in heaven above. But here is what we do have before us. 
Here is what we have in plain sight. We have the witness, the message of the apostles. We have their testimony written down. We have John's testimony that Jesus died and he rose again. And John's purpose in writing is that we should believe that testimony and by believing have life in Jesus' name. You're listening to Encounter the Truth with Jonathan Griffiths and a message called The Risen King. Now, we're going to pause right here, but we'll get back to this message in just a moment. Well, Encounter the Truth is a listener-supported broadcast. We depend on your generosity to keep this program on this station. And as you give a gift of any amount this month, we want to say thank you by sending you a book from Jonathan. It's called The King, The Cross, and The Meaning of Easter. I think this would be a great opportunity for us to send you a copy of this book as our way of saying thank you for your financial support this month. You can find out more or give online when you come to EncounterTheTruth.org or call us at 833-99-TRUTH. That's 1-833-998-7884 or again the website EncounterTheTruth.org. Well, if you joined us a little bit late, we're in John chapter 20, so join us there as we get back to the message. Here is Jonathan. I think there's essentially one big point to this remarkable passage. And so I only want to make one simple point in this sermon. For those expecting three or four points, I hope you won't feel too disappointed or shortchanged this morning. I want to make one simple point, then I want to apply that truth in two simple ways. Here's the point. Here's the heart of this resurrection passage. It is simply this. Those who believe have life in Jesus' name. Those who believe that this risen Jesus is the Christ, the promised Messiah, King, the Son of God, those who believe they have life in Jesus' name. God promised centuries and generations before that he would send a king into the world, a Messiah, who would be his own son. He would liberate his people from bondage and bring them into a glorious future. The Israelites of Jesus' day thought that their Messiah would come and liberate them from Roman oppression and lead them into a glorious political and national future future. And so when Jesus came along and he didn't take up a sword and he didn't lead a political movement or set out a political vision, the people, they just didn't know what to do with him. They eventually came to resent him and they largely rejected him as their Messiah. This man can't be the promised savior. Where is the sword? Where is the political movement? Where is the king that we've been waiting for? And hence their eagerness to have him removed from the scene. But what so many people failed to see was this. God's plan for his saving king wasn't so small and so meager as for him merely to bring about a political or a military liberation. To save the nation from the Romans or any other worldly power. No, God's plan and God's ambition was far greater His Christ, his Messiah, his son would come and liberate humanity from its deepest bondage and address its deepest need. The Bible tells us that the root cause of all pain and all suffering and all bondage in this world is the fact that we've turned from God to live our own way without reference to him. We've become alienated From him as a whole people. We've invited his judgment for the evil that we have thought and said and done. And we experience the fruit of that rebellion as the beauty of human life ends again and again in the tragedy of the grave. Now, now that's our deepest need. That's our biggest problem. We are a people who were created to live, but because of sin, we are destined to die. And so God's plan for his Messiah was for him to come into the world and pay the price of that rebellion to bear the judgment for sin at the cross and then to rise again in victory over the grave. That was God's plan for his Messiah, his saving king, even his son. 
And what John wants us to see and what John wants us to believe, verse 31, is that this Jesus, the risen Jesus, is indeed the Christ, is indeed the Son of God, is indeed the Savior that the people of God had been waiting for all these years and generations. John has recorded plenty of miracles in his book, plenty of what he calls signs, but the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the grave, it is the greatest one of all. You see, if Jesus did in fact conquer the grave, then all his claims must be true. His gospel must be valid. His power, it must be limitless. And the record of the resurrection is here in John chapter 20 for us to consider, for us to accept, for us to believe. We have eyewitness testimony. And of course, added to all that, we have the evidence of 2,000 years of history since. History that shows us how the historical fact of the resurrection of Jesus Christ has transformed lives and reshaped world history. And so today we have an offer, and we have an opportunity. There is blessing for those who have not seen and yet have believed. There is nothing less on offer than life in his name. I sometimes have a bit of background music playing on a YouTube playlist when I'm working. That can be nice and helpful sometimes. Maybe you do that too. But when you do that, occasionally you have to endure these ads which punctuate the playlist and come as a real distraction. For a while, there was an ad that kept popping up on my playlist for a guy who promised that he could basically teach anyone to sing. That got my attention. And I think the gist of it was basically this. He's a great singer, I guess. He figured out how to sing well himself, and he now has a massive track record of teaching other people to sing like opera stars or something like that. There are ads for all kinds of similar things on there. You've probably seen them. You know, I, I figured out how to write a best-selling novel, and I can teach you to as well. I, I went from couch potato to weightlifting superstar, and I can get you there in six weeks or whatever, and on and on it, it goes. Jesus Christ, he's conquered the grave. Here's the eyewitness account telling us that he's done that. And the offer of the gospel, the offer of Easter is simply this. The one who has conquered the grave, the one who has walked through death to life at the other side, he can carry us through death into eternal life. He's done it himself. He has a track record in this. Having died on the cross, he has appeared to eyewitnesses. He has shown himself to be the living one. And he offers the blessing of life, true life, life beyond the grave, eternal life to all who will believe. Those who believe have life in Jesus' name. Th that's it. <laughs> That's the point of this great passage. That's the heart of its message. That is, in fact, the heart of the message of Easter. Now, I want to take this very simple but profound truth, and I want to apply it in two different directions for us. I want to apply it, first of all, to those who know Jesus and who trust Jesus, those who have already believed and who know him. And I have a simple application for you, if that is you today. I have a simple encouragement for you this Easter Sunday, this Resurrection Day. Here's one application for you. If you believe, you do have life. If you do believe in Jesus, you do indeed have life in his name. Friends, let me encourage you and reassure you this strange Easter, in this strange season, in this strange year, if you have put your trust in Jesus Christ, you have life. I think we all sense that this crisis is going to cost us, each one. It's going to cost us in some way before it's done. I think we all sense and we know instinctively that the world is never going to be the same again. 
when we come out the other side of this. Yes, quarantine and social distancing and movement restrictions will eventually be lifted, we trust. But when the dust settles and all is finished, the world will never quite be the same again. Some among us will have lost health. Some will have lost life. Some will have lost loved ones. Some will have lost jobs. A number will have lost wealth and homes. There's going to be a cost, a substantial and a painful cost for many people. And some are already experiencing it. Maybe you are already experiencing it in some painful ways even today. And friends, I don't know what the cost is going to be ultimately for me or for you. But this Easter Sunday, we're reminded from the Scriptures that if we believe in Jesus, we have already received something that the coronavirus cannot touch and cannot take away. The economists are talking about another great depression And health authorities, they're starting to estimate the numbers who might perish. But whether it be worldly wealth or mortal life, whether it be any of those things that this virus takes from us, here is something we know and can put our trust in and may have confidence in. This virus, it cannot take life from us, the life that Jesus gives. If we believe in Jesus, we have been given eternal life, life beyond the grave, even resurrection life. Be encouraged this Easter, brothers and sisters in Christ. You have a blessing from God in Jesus that cannot be taken away from you. Friends, for those who don't yet know Jesus, who have not yet believed, here is a single and a simple application for you. If you would believe, you can have life. If you would believe that Jesus is God's promised Savior, if you would believe that he rose from the dead, here is the promise for you. He will give you life. Friends, I cannot offer you a cure for the virus, and I cannot offer you any shield from its effects in this world. But on the basis of God's Word, here is what I can offer you today. I can offer you life in Jesus' name. I can offer you resurrection life beyond the grave because Jesus died for your sin And because Jesus rose again on the third day, I can offer you that life because Jesus himself offers you that life in his word. Blessed are those, says Jesus, who have not seen and yet have believed. And so here's the great question. Would you believe in him even today? Would you turn from sinful rebellion and trust in him? Would you trust him with your life? And would you trust him even with your death? Jesus tells us, he promises us that we will have life in his name through believing that he is indeed the Christ, the Son of God, the living one. Would you believe even today? Jonathan Griffiths here on Encounter the Truth and a message called The Risen King. Really a helpful look today at John chapter 20. And if you've missed any part of this broadcast, you can come and you can listen at our website. It's EncounterTheTruth.org. You can also listen if you have the Encounter the Truth app. You'll find that at your favorite app store. Simply look for Encounter the Truth, and that's a great way to stay connected with Jonathan's teaching. Well, has listening to this program helped you in your walk with Jesus? You know, we would love to hear how the Lord is using Encounter the Truth in your life. You can contact us through our website and let us know. 
how God may be using this program in your life. And if you've got a prayer request, let us know. We'd be happy to pray for you as well. You can reach us through the website, EncounterTheTruth.org. That's EncounterTheTruth.org. Well, thanks to our producer, Mark Bretta. For Jonathan, I'm Steve Hiller, and I hope you'll join us next time for Encounter the Truth. Encounter the Truth.